So Amy, since this is a podcast about words and how the way we use them affects what we believe to be true, here's a word question for you. Did you know that the word distraction was once a synonym for insane? Uh, no, uh, but I love synonyms. I love wordplay. So this is right up my alley. Thank you very much. Although I'm not really excited about this word having a synonym that means the same as insane because that makes me kind of wonder. Uh, maybe, maybe that's part of my problem. I don't know. I won't go down that road. But as a teacher, I can definitely see that, you know, distraction is a big part of the classroom. Uh, it's not just kids who get distracted. Experts say we check our phones about every 12 minutes. That's, that's a lot. Uh, so it's a problem in families and workplaces as well as school. Yeah, it's a problem on the roads, too. I've read that 3,000 people die each year from crashes caused by distracted driving. And it's frustrating to me. Why can't I do more than one thing at a time? Why can't I focus? Um, is it digitization that's causing my brain to play hopscotch or did my ancestors struggle with distraction too? Well, I, I will we'll figure that out, um, you know, because we are not the experts, but we do have an expert with us tonight. Hi, I'm Holland Webb. Hi, I'm Amy Bolin. And you're listening to The Afterword. A conversation about the future of words. To talk about focus and distraction, we are welcoming our guest from Assumption University, Dr. James Lang, but he has given us permission to call him Jim. So we are very glad to have you at the table. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Jim, in just 60 seconds, would you give us the Cliff's Notes version of your life and how you got to talk about focus and distraction? Yep. So um, I started my career as an English professor, um, and that's what I went to graduate school for, and I got my PhD in English literature. Um, but early on in my career, even in graduate school, I became interested in um, teaching and learning and how um, humans learn and what the implications of that were for classroom teaching. Um, as you might know, uh, most college and university faculty don't get any training in how to teach students, um, unlike K-12 teachers. Um, so we have to kind of figure things out as, as we go, um, but there have been um, these centers for teaching which have arisen at colleges and universities across the country over the past few decades that have been devoted to helping college and university faculty think more um, carefully about teaching and their teaching practices. So I got involved in a teaching center early in my career. Um, then I left that institution, which is where I got my PhD at Northwestern. I uh, took a job as a regular English professor and I did that for a dozen years. But I kept thinking and writing about teaching, actually, and the implications of the literature on teaching and learning for college faculty. And then in 2013, I founded the Center for Teaching Excellence on my campus. Um, so I was the founding director of that and have just continued to write about teaching and learning. Um, and I might, writing is often driven by problems. So like, what are the problems that we see in education? And then once I identify a problem that I think a lot of people are struggling with to then kind of look at the research and say, all right, well, what does the research tell us? And I first did this with cheating, actually. So I have a book that came out a few years ago called Cheating Lessons. And the promise of that book is what can we learn from when we look at uh, instances of when students cheat? What can we learn from that about how to be more effective educators? And I basically, seven years later, took the same lens and applied it to distraction. Um, what is it? What is it? What is happening when students are distracted in the classroom? Uh, and what can we learn from that about how to be effective educators? Um, and so that's kind of been where things have stood. The book came out in uh, the fall of 2020, um, in the middle of the pandemic, of course, when we were all learning online. So that was kind of interesting, too, because I finished it a month before the pandemic hit. Um, so uh, fortunately, the, you know, the ideas and the principles are, are ones that are kind of were designed to work in any kind of educational environment, whether it was face to face or online. Um, but it's very it's been interesting to see how it's kind of the ideas have been received in this very different climate. Yeah, that's wonderful. I, I as you're talking, my wheels are kicking in and I'm just thinking about the universality, not just in teaching and learning. But I mean, when we think about life, life is all about teaching and learning, um, you know, so we're all educators at some point with something and we're all learners at some point. But because you have drilled down 
into your writing, let's let's just define a few terms just to make sure we understand. Because sometimes we get, as um, Holland provided these words earlier about distraction and insane. Um, let's let's take a look at a couple words and see if we can't drill down a little bit. The first one, Jim, is focus. What do you give us the average layperson's understanding of focus and what does it really mean? Well, attention and focus actually are two incredibly hard words to define. Um, and, you know, William James, the uh, this great sort of founder of modern psychology, um, essentially said, you know, this is the kind of thing that we all just know what it is, but it's really hard to actually parcel out what, what it means. The, the one, the easiest thing that is to say about it is it means sort of, it actually has two broad things though to think about. The first is attention to what you're doing, right? So like I'm, 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 um, you know, sort of locked in on, on a task or, or thought or whatever. But the other side of that is I'm blocking out other things. And these are actually not the same thing in our brain. So like, these are kind of two separate processes in the brain is to to focus and, and um, pay close attention to a particular task or thought or person, but then to make sure that I'm doing that selectively so that the other things around me are kind of losing, um, losing salience in my mind. So attention researchers often talk about it as a spotlight, right? So um, our focus is some, the, the easy way to understand is um, imagine a dark room. You put a spotlight on something, you can see that thing clearly, but it's sort of, it dims out a lot of other stuff, right? When you're really focused. So when you really are focused, you're not seeing a lot of other the sort of ambient stuff and not, a lot of things aren't getting in the way. And that enables you, that enables the spotlight to work on that one thing. That is a great word picture. I really appreciate that. How about distraction then? So the literal roots of the word distraction um, mean to be sort of dragged away. Um, so dis and tract uh, mean to be sort of pulled pulled apart, essentially. Uh, and that's a, it's a good way to understand. I mean, I think that's the easiest way to understand that word. Um, you're being pulled in different directions. Um, we often today think about it as being, I'm trying to do one thing and something else is, is, is tugging me in another direction. Um, or I'm, I'm pushing myself in another direction through my own sort of volition. I, like, it's sort of involuntary, voluntary. I mean, this, that's, that's a problem. There's a kind of mix of, there's voluntary distractions and involuntary distractions, right? Voluntary distractions are when I choose to go, you know, on my phone or when I um, decide to go do some fold laundry instead of working. Involuntary or when like the dog barks or like, you know, um, something interferes with my paying attention. But there is a vast middle ground here, too, between voluntary and involuntary, which is like I would like to be working. and I'm not really consciously deciding to watch YouTube videos for an hour. And yet it sometimes some, somehow just sort of happens, <laughs> right? So there's that vast middle ground. But anyways, the, the easiest way to understand distraction is just, like I said, go to the root of the word. It means being dragged apart in different directions. Yikes. I don't know if that's any better than insane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, goodness. How about uh, digital minimalism? Haven't got a clue. That's a strategy that people used um, to try to reduce the amount of distractions in their lives. Um, so to kind of just, you know, take, um, you reduce your social media, like really take a more lean and kind of strip down um, attitude toward the technologies that a lot of us use in our everyday lives. Um, and, you know, th th that, that can work for some people. Unfortunately, many of us have to use technologies in our everyday lives. So it's a little bit harder to do that. Um, depending upon your circumstances and the kind of job you have. Um, it's very hard for me to do that as a higher education teacher uh, and someone who does a lot of time. And, and, and as a writer today, like, you know, I've got to be promoting my work on social media. I've got to be doing this kind of thing. My wife is a kindergarten teacher. Um, she can spend a lot of time in her classroom with no, you know, technology where her students are doing things, you know, centers and, um, She's reading stories to them. You know, they're going to have their iPad times at the centers. But still, there's a lot of time in that classroom when um, there's nothing digital going on. That's, that's, that's almost impossible um, for the kind of work that I do. So people are going to find different abilities to adapt a digitally minimal lifestyle. Yeah, very good. So not everybody, you know, can pull themselves away from technology, but maybe you can do the basket at the at the table that says all phones go in the basket. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Okay. You can certainly make choice. We all have the ability to work within a range, right? Like yeah. so the range of, of engagement levels that we might have with technology. A digital minimus is going to sort of push toward the, the, you know, the low end of that range. Okay. 
All right. So let's, let's talk about productivity. And, and I want to, you know, I I've heard that multitasking is actually a myth. <laughs> so let's, let's talk about some productivity. Multitasking is, um, is a myth in the sense that we don't, we, well, it's a little, it's complicated, of course, as with all these things, but, but the two, let's, I'll say two things about it. One is um, when people think they're multitasking, what they're actually doing is rapidly task switching. So you're switching back and forth between different things rather than just doing two things at the same time. So our brains are not really equipped to do two things of a similar nature at the same time. So you can't really read and listen to this podcast. You'll be rapidly switching back and forth and you're, you're, um, your comprehension of both is going to diminish as a result of that. Now, having said that, if you're doing two very different things, you can essentially multitask. I can, you can listen to this podcast and fold your laundry, right? Especially if you're someone who's folded a lot of laundry in your life and who's not like, you know, particular about the folding of your laundry, right? So like things that you've learned to do on automatic pilot um, and driving is another one of those things. We, you know, you, we can, you can't really like look at your, you shouldn't be looking at your phone and take, cause that draws your eyes away from the road. But, and, and even if you do listen to a podcast, it still can diminish your driving ability somewhat. But at the same time, most of us do listen to the radio or can talk to another passenger while we're driving because it, especially as we become more and more experienced as drivers. But again, it's, it's, it's when the areas that you're working in kind of overlap cognitively, that's when you really cannot do it. Um, but if one thing is on, you can do relatively automatically, like walking, for example, we can walk and because you can walk and pay attention to your walking, but you can just walk and also listen to a podcast. Those are two different things, but you can do them because they're, they're, they're occupying different parts of your brain. Hmm. Okay. I really appreciate that. I, I actually have gotten lost in a podcast and missed an exit before. Um, <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even talking <laughs> on the phone without, you know, hands free actually does diminish your ability to pay attention to, to the road. So, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So our last word for tonight is boredom. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, teacher people, uh, wants to come and say, mom, I'm bored. Yeah. And, you know, people sort of argue today that we've, you know, that's a, a new phenomenon because we need, we always feel like we need to be on and we're always entertained and stuff, but, you know, people have never loved being bored. <laughs> um, that's always something that, um, I, I, I'm a professor of English literature, and so I, my area is actually 20th century British literature. And um, there was a project that was done in the 1930s and 40s in Britain. It was a, like a public works project, essentially, where um, they sort of did interviews with people. And they sort of like recording what life, daily life was like for a lot of British people. One of them is essentially, a, and so they put in, they then put out in the, all these books. Um, like one was about the pub, pub life, and, and one was about Sundays. And essentially, if you read the book, it's quite interesting to see how people, many of the people didn't like Sunday because it was like the day where there was nothing to do, right? And like, you know, that, that in some ways can be, um, you know, depressing or anxiety producing, right? When, you, when your brain has nothing to occupy it, um, it, it some psychologists will argue that and because um, from, from an evolutionary perspective, if you didn't have anything to think about, the best thing to think about was, what are the potential problems coming up? And so how do I prepare for the next disaster, right? So like, that's what our early ancestors would have been thinking about. So that the people that thought like that were the people that were more likely to survive, which means our brains have kind of evolved in that way. So when we have nothing to think about, we do tend to think more about negative things. We tend to ruminate, we tend to think about like past problems or predict, think, wonder about the negative, we, we worry. That was evolutionarily adaptive for us. It's, it's less so now when we don't, you know, we're not facing those kinds of daily challenges to our survival. So, you know, the fact that people are unhappy with boredom today and that, you know, people complain about it and people have always felt that way. And in some ways you might, you know, think that that's kind of a, bit, a part of our basic brain architecture. Okay. I, you know, again, I really appreciate digging into these words a little bit and helping shed some light and, and even the history. I, I think that's fascinating, the stories behind the words. So thank you so much. 
appreciate what you said about the history on boredom because I remember reading books maybe by Laura Ingalls Wilder and she would talk about being bored at different times even though she didn't have technology uh, digital technology or anything even close to she didn't even have very many books to read or a TV to watch she would still talk about being bored when when uh, certain stimulus were certain stimuli were missing yeah and actually just one other thing I'll say about that just to fill this out a little bit in a more positive way there is um, something called the default network in our brain, which is essentially what's happening, what, what is operating when you're not specifically trying to do something or like direct your attention somewhere. And, and uh, you know, the, there's been all kinds of um, studies about what the default network does, but part of what it, it seems that the default network is actually really important in um, creative thinking in like helping us um, consolidate things that we've learned and experienced so there does seem, and, and, and then maybe that that's what's, you know, as we're sleeping or like as we're, um, you know, when we just are doing other things that don't really occupy our time, like kind of mindless tasks, like the default network is operating and it operates when you're bored. Um, and then it, there is, um, there's a re, there's, there's a use for that actually. So while we do, we certainly can understand, you know, why people complain about being bored and, and there's no reason to, you know, think that that's any new phenomenon. Um, it is also the case that having time for your mind to just sort of wander and, and let that default network operate um, is probably helpful to us. That's good to know. Okay, let's launch with this question. Back in 2008, The Atlantic published an article entitled, Is Google Making Us Stupid? This was 13 years ago. And in it, the author argued that the internet is diminishing our capacity for contemplation and concentration. So I'd just like to start with that question. Is Google making us stupid? Okay. So here you have to, again, think about the long history of the human brain, right? Which evolved over many thousands of years. Um, and <laughs> the human brain it doesn't sort of change as a result of like 10 years of engagement with smartphones, right? Like the architecture of the human brain is something that's just think it's like, you know, it's, it's like any one of our organs, right? Like it's not like all of a sudden, um, you know, our, our fingers are going to start changing because of the, because of the way we text, right? I mean, maybe that'll happen over many, many generations, but it's not going to happen in 10 years. Um, so there, there's, there's two, ways to think about that idea. I think that probably was a piece by Nicholas Carr, who then wrote about it in his book, The Shallows. And, and in that book, Carr argues essentially that, you know, we used to have these calm, linear minds uh, that, that have been sort of destroyed by the shallowness of the internet and our attention spans are diminishing. That is just not true. Um, we Human minds we have never been sort of calm and linear and able to just focus for as long as they want to. And you, we can go back to Aristotle, who talks about, you know, people eating snacks in the theater and disrupting, you know, the performance when they're not enjoying the plays. Um, he talks about people trying to listen to arguments and being distracted by someone playing a flute in the background. Um, you know, so... You know, in the book, I kind of go through a whole bunch of these examples, but but when we go, as long as people have been talking about the human brain, they've been talking about the fact that they feel distracted. Um, so, like, th this just is not, it's not really historically accurate to say that that somehow we're, we're being, our brains are being changed or we're being made stupid by Google. Now, I will say this, however, um, one of the things that Google has done is, this is a, almost a completely different subject, but but it's making us feel like we don't need to remember things anymore. And that also is not really true. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we've learned from uh, a few, the, the research on um, learning and memory is that um, when people, you know, we often think, well, I'll just, I don't need to memorize the facts. I'll just look them up when I need them. And I'll just work on practicing my critical thinking and being creative and all that stuff. And teachers often think that too. I'm going to just teach students how to think, but they can look up the facts. I don't need to teach them that anymore. Actually, what we have learned is that you think better when you know facts. Um, and the more facts and knowledge and concepts and information you have at your disposal, the more you are able to think critically and creatively. So in a way, we are doing students a disservice um, when we sort of take this attitude that we don't have to teach them things anymore. We're just supposed to, you know, help them think. Um, they can't really think. <laughs> they don't have anything to think about. So, um, so, so there's a way in which, um, unfortunately, like Google and easy access to search engines have promulgated this belief that we don't have to know things anymore. 
So that that part of it, one could argue, there's maybe a tiny truth to that statement. When it comes to distraction and tension, though, it's not really. Um, I don't. I don't think history or biology bears that statement out. Okay, well, that's good to know, and I do appreciate the the balance. That's what I'm hearing. You know, it's not that we are going to throw critical thinking out. You know, throw the baby out with the bathwater. But you know, all having all rote learning isn't fun. So I'm going to be distracted if all I'm having to do is, you know, yeah. so there's that balance and, you know, you, you've really hit um, a, a couple of these topics. You talked about Aristotle and we have uh, a, a complaint from Socrates 400 years ago or 400 BC about how writing things down diminished the mind because then people didn't have to remember them. Right. And, you know, it's, it's really kind of funny, the, the back and forth of, you know, well, I think this and I think that, but you know, what are the innate seeds of distraction as you have kind of mentioned over and over again? I like how you use the word architecture of the brain. You know, how, how can we look at that history and, of, uh, and the biology of distraction? Well, again, you just think about sort of how, how a brain works and what it's supposed to be doing. Um, and again, you think about like the fact that we, you know, emerged from this sort of long evolution um, and we had to be able to do two things. We had, among many others, we had to be able to focus on things that, that were going to help us, like finding a food source, right? Or like um, keeping our family groups together. But we also had to be hyper attentive to the surround, to our surroundings and to our environment. And, and so, you know, if I were just sort of hunting an animal, but then completely focused on that and able to block everything out around me, <laughs> then I'm going to become prey to some other animal, right? So like, I need to have this dual capacity. I need to have the capacity to focus, but I also need to have the capacity to kind of be attentive to things going on around me. And I also need to have the capacity to notice novel things in my environment and to be curious. Um, and so like those things all really served us well, right? Curious creatures. Um, you know, try stuff. Like I see something new. I'm like, what's that? Like I, um, and then I fool around with it and I, I try different using it for different purposes or like, you know, crack it open and see what's there. Those things led to, you know, the discoveries that made us who we were, that attitude, but those things are still with us. Those, those habits, practices, those, those, those sort of, um, that the, the wiring in our brain that leads to those things is still with us. So that means that, you know, in a classroom setting, um, if, if things are, you know, slow or if I'm not like feeling engaged, um, my brain's going to want to go, what else? Like what's around us? Well, you know, what else, what, 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 where can I, um, get some stimulation here? Um, so we our brains have the habit of doing that. And, um, that's, again, it was, you know, you have to go back to the, the, what, how brains came about and what they're for. Um, that was really helpful and it, it was useful and um, it's going to continue to, you know, we're going to continue to carry those brains with us for, you know, at least the foreseeable future of well, our generation and probably quite a few to come um, before any kind of change might happen. So um, yeah, that's the basic kind of understanding. You can, you can actually, I have a bird feeder right here on, that I'm looking at. And when a bird is on that feeder, they are pecking away at the seeds, but I mean, you, you how often they like, look up and like look around and check for you know something a hawk or whatever like they're constantly doing that and they have to right because the bird that didn't do that is going to get you know picked off and that bird is not going to pass along their genes so you know, all, all, most animals have this sort of dual capacity as we do to you know focus but also be open to novelty and distractions in the environment I really appreciate that that dual um, capacity. I love that. Um, and it always kind of makes you think, you wonder, what was that person thinking when they did pick up that novel thing and go, huh? Right, 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 right. You know, First when we did our coconut, right? Like, you know, right. Well, right. we did our episode on coffee, Holland. And, you know, you've got right. the shepherd you know, who's watching these goats, you know, have all this energy and like, ah, oh, what, why do they, you know, so yeah. it's just, that's just amazing. Yeah. 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 Who first thought to soak tea leaves and like hot water? Like, where did that come? <laughs> right. But you know, the, just uh, everything that we have and do like became about because someone has got like a curious mind that was like, I wonder what happens if I do that. <laughs> um, and it's, it's that that drives us towards innovation and creativity and learning, but it also can drive us to distraction. Sure. I hadn't thought about it in terms of 
predator and prey and that uh, our ancestors were, were both or destined to become one or the other depending on what they were paying attention to. <laughs> right, right, right. right. Um, okay, so about a year ago, we did an episode on moral outrage and social media. And we talked about the deleterious effects of morally inspired outrage. And I've read that distraction not only hijacks our attention, but it also arouses our anger with nowhere productive for that anger to go. Is that true? Does distraction impact our emotions in a negative way? Um, I am not exactly sure about that one. I don't know if there's like a consistent relationship between distraction and, and any particular negative emotion. Um, I would say, but to, just, just to go back to the start of your question, where you were talking about the kind of moral outrage and, um, you know, th there has been a, obviously a kind of, um, I, I would call it a moral panic that we've been, that we experience about distraction and attention, right? Where like, like a sort of gradually unfolding one over the course of the past decade, where like, we're, we're more and more worried about, as the question you asked me earlier, like, is our brains being changed? Are we being made stupid? Um, Technology is doing all these things to us. And then we get kind of angry about that. I mean, maybe that is, maybe that's where the anger comes from. We get kind of angry that these, this is happening or feel frustrated that we can't seem to do anything to stop it. Um, and, you know, I think it's always the, 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 the um, when we look at the history in biology, what that enables us to do is to step back from that moral panic and that outrage and say, okay, wait a minute, this is a problem that we've been dealing with a long time. For some reason, every so often, we seem to kind of like whip ourselves up into a frenzy about it. But, um, you know, this is pretty, this is a pretty ancient issue. Um, and so that, that can help us not critically, uncritically, not uncritically embrace um, concepts and practices that are going to um, not, not be productive solutions. So one of the concepts that has emerged in the past couple of decades is this idea of digital natives, right? That our students are digital natives and that therefore, um, you know, they all have always been around their digital devices. Therefore, like they're somehow fundamentally different than we are, those of us who were not raised on phones. Um, and so, uh, unfortunately, that concept has got almost no, the, the, the idea that digital natives are somehow fundamentally different from us or that we have to teach differently to them, that concept has not actually been backed by that much research. It was sort of promoted by a guy who um, was kind of a, a writer and a thinker who, you know, is like a futurist is what he calls himself. Um, and it makes a kind of intuitive sense. Like, you know, our students clearly have grown up in a fallen world and, and many of us have not. At the same time, anyone who's ever worked with students and tried to introduce them to like some new technologies that in education and learning has discovered, they don't just automatically figure things out, right? I've had to help my students, my twins who are like 16, figure out basic features of Microsoft Word. Just because they can use TikTok and Snapchat doesn't mean they can somehow automatically figure out new technologies. And it doesn't also mean that their brains are somehow fundamentally different than ours. So, like, I think that's a concept that kind of actually can drive a wedge between students and their educators. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we got to be careful and just always be aware of the sort of um, the broader context of these these debates that we're having um, and not just kind of, yeah, that makes sense. Digital natives. Yeah, we got to do everything differently. You know, it's a lot like learning styles, right? So learning styles was a huge topic where, um, you know, the, this theory was that everybody learned differently. We had to teach to everybody's different learning style. Well, of course, we discovered now that, yes, everyone learns differently, but you don't have to teach to people's individual learning styles. In fact, it's better sometimes when people have to learn in a style that's, that's, that's not comfortable for them. Because when we struggle, we, we sometimes learn it more deeply than if we learn it in a way that feels really comfortable to us. So, you know, if, in education, these things catch on. <laughs> and then, you know, we, they, they, they hang around for a couple of decades and then eventually the next thing comes around. <laughs> but um, anyways, I think the research and the history and the biology can help us step back from some of that, you know, outrage and panic. Mm, I love that. Paul Thomas just talked about that, um, saying that we're not patient learners. Mm. You know, I mean, he yeah. he did he did research back in the 20s and 30s of educators. He said, I can pull out some of their stuff and people think it's modern day because yeah. we're just not patient in the process. And I, I go back to that, your your idea of boredom and how maybe having that default network 
mm. help us to step back a little bit from this moral panic. Um, I do know that what I, I don't know for our digital natives if they have had the filter or the being given the permission to not be assaulted by social media because it does seem like they have had that negativity just poured over them where maybe we didn't growing up. You know, I didn't know what the whole world was saying about me. Um, right, right. On social media. Right. And there may be, I, I'm not saying there's not differences in generations. Of course there are. Um, but at the same time, I know plenty of students who, who, who are very deliberate about putting their devices away and wanting to spend time away from their devices. Um, you know, my daughter, one of my daughters loves to go on hikes and she goes on long hikes without access to her technologies. And she knows that she needs that time. Um, so, you know, many students are, are, I think, are much more um, savvy and aware about this than we realize. Um, they fight with their, you know, sort of distractible brains as we all do. And maybe the fact that we're sometimes more effective at that fight is, has a lot to do with just sort of our, um, our, our age, our life experience and our kind of, you know, fact that we've been studying and learning in these issues for a while. Right? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. Yeah, yeah. That's a great point. So Jim, what's an essential element that we need to understand as we think about focus and distraction? So I would argue that um, most of us think about d distraction as being like the as attention as the norm and distraction as the falling away from that norm. And I would actually argue the more productive way to think about this is distraction is more like the ocean in which we are always swimming. And attention is like the islands that kind of rise out of that ocean when the circumstances are right. So we should think about attention as an achievement rather than as a given. And if we think about it like that, then we can then ask, we can then ask the important question, which is what helps us achieve attention? And that is what leads us to the practical thinking that can kind of help us tackle this problem, whether it's for ourselves or for our students. So to me, that's the question that we have to keep asking. And I always encourage um, educators to think about this. For example, what, when are you paying attention? Like what holds your attention? And step back from that and say, okay, well, what's going on there? Why, why do I pay attention in that situation? Um, what are the elements there that I can then apply to my own classroom, for example, or that I can apply to my to other parts of my life. I pay attention in this area. Was well, there a way to create, recreate those circumstances in this other area? Um, so that to me is, the, is really the fundamental thing that I'm just always trying to argue to people. Think about attention as an achievement, and then you can be deliberate about cultivating it. If you don't think about it like that, what you do instead is constantly berate yourself for being distracted. Um, which I, is what I hear from people all the time. I'm so, you know, whenever people hear I wrote a book about attention, you know, I, uh, they, they always say the same thing. I'm so distracted. I need that book for myself, et cetera, et cetera, because we all feel that way. Um, but what I would try to do to, cre to create for people is a sense of empathy and compassion. Don't worry, we're all distracted and that's how you were built. But at the same time, there's some, there are things that you can do about it, but you've got to be deliberate and thoughtful about it. Yeah, I love that. My only fear, though, is the is the word picture of the ocean. I think I'm going to need some floaties or something. <laughs> yeah, to get you from island to island. To get me to island to island or a canoe or a kayak. Yeah. I'm just trying to swim from one to the other. I'm, uh, yeah. That's a nightmare. So yeah, thank you. For sure. It's wonderful. We have a lot more questions about focus and distraction, but for now, we're just going to say special thanks to Jim, uh, Dr. James Lang of Assumption, College, Assumption University. We have a lot more to talk about regarding focus and distraction. While you wait for part two, please go to theafterwardpodcast.com and become a subscriber. Leave us a review and uh, tell your friends about us. And as always, remember that you are welcome at our table. <laughs>